you would open your Bibles this morning to the book of First Timothy. The book of First Timothy. Very excited about starting uh, this book with you as a church. Um, we have been through many books together, many books of the Bible together. I know this is going to be uh, another journey together of learning and growing in Christ. Uh, we've been through the books of uh, Philippians together. Um, we've been through uh, Revelation recently, we've been through the book of Romans, took about four years. It probably will not take us that long to get through 1 Timothy. Um, if y'all would let me, I'd go back through the book of Romans again, that would be fine with me. Um, but uh, we've been through the book of Ephesians, we've been through the books of First and Second Peter together uh, many years ago, and uh, just so much enjoyed, been through the Gospel of John together, just been so uh, wonderful, just going through books of the Bible together as a church family, growing together. Went through the book of Ephesians. That was a huge, huge uh, growth in all of our lives as we went through the book of Ephesians together, but um, this has been a wonderful journey. We are opening now a new book, um, the letter of one of the pastoral epistles of Paul writing to his son, his apprentice, uh, his son in the Lord, not his biological son, but his son in the Lord who he had discipled and he had raised up and now sending out to the church in Ephesus to go there and to, uh, to make some pretty radical changes in the culture of the church in Ephesus and to begin to establish the church in sound doctrine. And so as we begin this book, I hope that you're as excited as I am, but the, the first series, the first part, we're going we're gonna to title uh, just in a broad uh, context of chapter one, uh, which is a series within a series, but it's going to be titled Strange Doctrines That Lead to Spiritual Shipwreck. Strange Doctrines That Lead to Spiritual Shipwreck. And so we're kind of looking at it titled in a negative, but what what Paul is describing to uh, his son in the Lord is that if you do not, dis if we do not disciple people in sound teaching and sound doctrine, what we'll end up with are churches that have strange doctrines that lead to spiritual shipwreck. Now the key verses, uh, if you'll go here with me, these key verses come from 1 Timothy 1. If you look at verse 3, as we're going to be there next week, 1 and 2 today, but verse 3 it says, As I urged you upon my departure from Macedonia, remain on at Ephesus, so that you may instruct certain men not to teach strange doctrines, nor to pay attention to myths and in endless genealogies which give rise to mere speculation, rather than furthering the administration of God, which is by faith. So Paul is telling Timothy, uh, there are some guys, there are some men in Ephesus that are preaching strange doctrines. And I want you to remain here and I want you to establish these men and others in sound doctrine. I want, I want you to, to, to be a pastor, to teach and to lead and disciple and make sure that this church is preaching correctly, teaching correctly. Then on down to 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 18 and 19. Look down with me, another key verse supporting the, the series here. It says, this command I entrust to you, Timothy, my son, in, in accordance with the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you fight the good fight, keeping faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected and suffered shipwreck in regard to their faith. Now, guys, I think we could probably say that is the worst thing that could possibly happen here at Crossroads is that there would come a time when embedded within the life of Crossroads Baptist Church that men would begin to teach strange doctrines and that the result of that would eventually be people that shipwreck 
their lives, shipwreck their lives, shipwreck the church ultimately uh, according to the faith, in regard to the faith. So that's probably the worst thing we could imagine. The best thing that we could imagine is that there would be true sons, true disciples of Jesus Christ that continue on in the true doctrines of the faith and the true faith that fight the good fight with conviction in their hearts to carry on the work of the ministry beyond our lives. That is the best thing that we could think about. And so the title is really kind of a negative showing what ultimately what Paul is trying to uh, refute and trying to correct. In a lot of ways, his instruction to Timothy are going to be, it's the instruction is given to him uh, in encouragement and love from his father, his spiritual dad, encouraging him to fight the good fight, to swim upstream. I heard a pastor say recently that a, even a dead fish can float downstream. But to fight and to swim upstream every time we go trout fishing, you know, you know which direction the trout are facing, right? Upstream. Fighting the current. Guys, I'm going to tell you, every church and every place in every place in the world that has ever been has had to fight upstream. There's never a time when a church can relax and just let go and start floating with the culture. The, the scripture teaches us that narrow is the road that leads to life and very few will find it, but wide is the road that leads to destruction and many pass down it. Guys, the church, the true bride of Christ, the true followers of Christ are never going to be in the majority. It's always going to be a fight and it's always going to have to happen from conviction. And it's really ultimately going to have to happen as believers are established in the word of God by being discipled. Discipleship is where a Paul comes alongside of a Timothy and establishes Timothy in sound doctrine and faith and we're going to talk about some of the nuances of that and some of the critical areas that we must establish uh, disciples in those that we're discipling those that we're teaching establish them in in order for them to be equipped with conviction to swim upstream to fight against the current of culture the current of this world is to fight with conviction against those things that want to sweep us away. And in this case, and in many cases around the world, it's not just to sweep us away. It's not to just discredit us or troll us online or dispute us or whatever. It's to kill. It's to put to death those who preach sound doctrine. And it was the case for all of these people that we're reading about here in 1 Timothy. Many believe that Timothy himself was martyred in Ephesus. Ultimately, he lost his life for what the Apostle Paul was encouraging him to do. It's so exciting to see a young man. King, don't listen to this, buddy. We won't get a big, the whole close your ears. But to see a young man who goes off to the University of Georgia and is living out his faith, and is swimming upstream, and is fighting against the current. Guys, there are, that just gives me so much joy. So much joy to see the way that uh, he is loving Jesus and walking in the Spirit and true conviction. It doesn't happen by accident. It will not happen unless it is intentional, it will not happen unless someone, I believe, is established in sound doctrine and conviction about those doctrines, those beliefs, those truths that have been established and founded upon the apostles. 
and the prophets of God and that are given to us by the Holy Spirit and the inspired word of God. You know, the beauty about this, guys, the beauty about this is, is that it is this word, it is this Bible, is all we need to be established, to be grounded. We need the Spirit of God and the Word of God. And that that is ultimately what brings about conviction and brings about truth in the establishment of sound doctrine so that we are headed in the right direction. We are believing the right things about God. Amen? We are believing the right things. And there are right teachings and wrong teachings. There is good doctrine and there is false doctrine. And what happens for Timothy is that he is commissioned by the Apostle Paul to remain there in Ephesus and to begin to make disciples of Jesus, to continue in the Word of God. So this morning, in taking these first two verses, we're going to just pull as much out of these two verses as we can to help us uh, rightly make disciples of Jesus Christ. And so there's so much here. So y'all got to listen fast, okay? So I'm going to have to talk fast. Y'all going to have to listen fast. Is walk through some of the things that we see here that are, that are communicated through these few verses. The first thing is this. The foundation for the advancement of sound doctrine is personal discipleship. In personal discipleship, there are... Uh, foundations and there are things that we see in the scripture here but I want you just to look again at 1st Timothy chapter 1 verses 1 and 2 look there with me these are the verses we're focusing on today Paul an apostle of Christ Jesus according to the commandment of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus Jesus, who is our hope, to Timothy, my true child in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. What a beautiful introduction. In this, we see first of all the foundation of, of uh, personal discipleship First of all, we see, I want to share with you, sound, personal, uh, biblical discipleship must have an apostolic foundation. An apostolic foundation. Uh, the Paul here says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus. And we just want to declare to you, because you already know this, I am not an apostle in the context that Paul is referring to here of himself. Paul is referring to himself as something very distinctive, very distinct, very specific to a small group of men. Paul, no doubt, used the term apostle in its more restricted sense to refer to those who had been personally commissioned by the risen Christ. Guys, I have not been knocked off any donkeys, blinded, and personally commissioned as an apostle of God in this way. Um, if I were to say that I have, you guys would have reason to have some major red flags today if I am referring to myself as an apostle the same way that Paul is referring to himself here in this scripture as an apostle. I hope we understand that. The apostle Paul received the revelation of the gospel directly through Jesus Christ. Look with, look with me here in Galatians 1 verses 11 
and 12, it says, For I would have you know, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man, for I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. This is very unique to the apostle Paul. If I were to say today, y'all, I have received a brand new revelation from the Lord Jesus Christ, and I want to share this with you here in church today, you guys should immediately remove me from this pulpit. There is no new revelation from Jesus Christ. It is finished in the Word of God. We don't add to it, and we don't take away from it. Sound doctrine, as opposed to strange doctrine, is preserved with an utmost trust in the inerrant, infallible scriptures given to us by the prophets of God, the apostles of God, and the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Paul was set apart by God even before he was born, uh, the Bible says. In Galatians 1, 15 and 16, it says, But when God, who had set me apart even from my mother's womb and called me through his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with flesh and blood." Paul had a very unique, guys, listen, you're going to misunderstand a lot of the Bible if you misunderstand how very specific God's working was through the apostles and unique to them. Things that are applied to them and that God did through them were very, very unique. Obviously, things that were done through the Lord Jesus Christ himself were very unique to Jesus. We have to be okay with that and understand that. Effective discipleship is generated from an absolute trust in, in the Bible and an absolute dependence upon the Bible. A lot of discipleship curriculum, a lot of things that we study in church, a lot of it, guys, is written by men. So men write the curriculum and they add their thoughts and ideas and then we are making disciples of what? Of a man's thoughts and ideas versus discipleship being founded in and grounded in the Word of God. It is critical that we follow in this conviction, conviction that we swim upstream when we're pressured to or the thought or idea that we can improve upon the Bible and that we need extra, extra stuff to make disciples, disciples of Jesus Christ who are saved by faith in Jesus, surrendered to being changed by Jesus, and sold out to the mission of Jesus. Secondly, so as a part of personal discipleship, it, is, uh, it has an apostolic foundation and it has a reverence for and an esteem for the apostles of God. Let me just ask y'all just real quick. Do y'all, we have that, don't we? We have that. We have an esteem and a reverence for the apostles of God. And not only commissioned directly by the Lord Jesus, but also uh, led by the Holy Spirit to write scripture. And so we have this esteem and reverence for that. In a lot of churches today, guys, there is more esteem for the creativity and the nuances of someone's teaching in the church that's extra biblical and that that is, oh man, I've never heard that before. Oh man, that's good. Oh man, that guy's creative. Oh guys, that's, that's powerful. But what he's saying has nothing to do with the word of God. What are we exalting? Man or 
God. When we exalt the scripture, we are exalting and esteeming Christ and the spirit of God. I mean, guys, there's nothing more blasphemous than to exalt men above God. As a part of personal discipleship, first of all, it's uh, it's founded uh, an apostolic foundation. Secondly, a a foundational belief, submission to, and instruction in God's commands is an essential element of discipleship. So as a part of um, our making disciples, and guys, I, I know you're listening. Even the young people here are listening because some of you are making disciples already, so you're hopefully listening to say, how can I be in a more effective disciple maker? And I'm so proud, thankful for some of our young people who are already making disciples. But understand, it's, it's apostolic in the context of Scripture. And secondly, as we talk about this, it has a lot to do with us uh, communicating, understanding the Lord's commands. Commands. Again, when we see in the Bible a command of God, guys, it is not our prerogative to pick and choose what commands God gives us as ones that we believe are still valuable culturally, uh, biblically, uh, in church culture, which ones we're going to adhere to and which ones we're going to throw away. Where we see a command in Scripture, we are, as a church, gathered together to say, I see God's Word commanding this in my life. And that means that I should obey this command. It is not something that I treat as frivolous or something I say, you know, maybe I'll get there. We say, no, we're always striving to live obedient lives because we love Him. Church, amen. And if you love me, Jesus said, you will obey my commands if you love me. Amen? Do you love him, church? Then then in the power of the Holy Spirit and in prayer for one another and in the strengthening power of his word and and love for him, We want to obey the commands of the Lord. So look here with me in verse 1 again. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, according to the commandment of God. Guys, I've wrestled with this. I don't know that I've fully wrapped my head around this thought that Timothy says, according to the commandment of God. I feel in my, I mean, just looking at this, studying this, all the, None of the commentaries, none of the things I was looking at after studying this text really uh, defined this uh, phrase. But I do believe that God has specifically ordained the Apostle Paul to be an apostle of God. And to walk and live in that function, to live out that commission of God upon his life. And so... In that commandment, I do believe that has a lot to do with Paul was commanded by the Lord to do this. And I asked the question, God, what have you commanded me to do? And are the commands of God general in the context of what Scripture commands us to do? But is it at times specific things that God is saying for you and I Brandon, do this. It may not be this audible voice, but the Spirit of God is leading my life and God is commanding specific things for me to do in the will of God and in the, according to the scriptures, obviously, obviously in agreement with the word of God. But I do believe the Spirit of God leads us to do to do specific things at specific times or for a lifetime. I think very early in my life that God said, 
I want you to be a pastor. And I want you to fulfill that role, that responsibility, that commissioning, that ordin- ordination from my church to do this. For some of you, it is pastoring. Some of it is being a deacon. For some of you, it's being a witness, an evangelist. For some of you, it's being a servant of the Lord. For some of you, it is helping. And some of it is mercy and just using your specific gifts in specific ways at specific times that the Holy Spirit is leading us in. Amen? It's obedience. It's obedience to the commands. But let's talk about it in different ways that... We understand the commands of God. So God commanded Paul to execute the office of apostle with authority. To, the, to command is with authority to impose upon someone your desired will. To arrange their lives, to arrange their assignments, their travels, their future, their destiny. At some point, King said, I need to go to Jamaica. I believe I'm supposed to go to Jamaica, right? So what do you do? It costs $1,875. Well, I don't have $1,875, but I believe the Lord's calling me to go to Jamaica. Some of you have experienced the same type things. I'm supposed to do this. I don't have the means to do it. But you just believe that God wants you to do something. For Paul, it was very specific command. I don't know about you guys, but I believe that God is the authority of our lives and is hopefully going to impose his desired will on our lives. Any of you say, I'm I'm up, I'm ready. God, impose your will upon my life. For some of you, that scares you to death, maybe. I want to do what I want to do. Well, just let me know how that works out for you there. There's no greater joy in this world than for God to impose his will and accomplish his will and accomplish his purposes through our little lives. There is no joy like that kind of joy. I hope you've tried it recently. Paul is walking in submission to the calling and the command of the Lord Jesus Christ upon his life. And Lord, help me to know the things that I think you're telling me to do that aren't what you're telling me to do. Help me realize those things really quick. Amen? Effective disciple makers live in submission to specific commands that the Lord has given to them. So then we drop, we, we move to the word of God. When we're asking God, what is your will for my life? It, it must force us to the word of God. And the more we are in the word of God, the more we are hearing the commands of God and the spirit of God is going to line up our life with the word of God and we are going to begin to submit to and live in and walk in the will of the spirit, the will of God. Specific biblical commands. And I would say this is where every believer must start. We start with what has the Bible commanded us to do? So, so many people are like, you know, let me, just, let me just feel where I'm led. Let me just coast around and feel, feel out what I need to be doing with my life. No, go to the Bible. What does God command us to do? Do that, do that. The rest will take care of itself. Anybody agree with that? Say amen. Do what the Bible says to do. Some of you are not in the Bible. You don't read the Bible. You're, you hear the Bible on Sundays or maybe somebody, you know, lectures to you on some other time during the week, but you're not in the Bible. You're not hearing those commands. Or maybe you're reading the Bible, but you're not reading with a submissive heart to the commands of God. And it's very difficult 
very difficult for you to ever get to the place where you're making disciples if you're not in the Word yourself and submissive to the commands of God in your own personal life. How can we disciple someone else if we're neglecting God's commands in our own life? This is where discipleship, this is the foundation for discipleship. And this is ultimately what is going to lead you toward making disciples of others is because that's what the New Testament is about. What has the Lord commanded us to do? How is the Lord arranging our lives, our future, our destiny, and everyday life for his glory Effective disciple makers believe the Lord's commands. Now, this would not even be something that you would even have to say in some places in the world. You know, that God said it, I believe it, that settles it. Most of, I won't say most, many places in the world when you go and you gather together with believers in a secret church. You gather together with believers in northern India in a secret church. Guys, this is not even a point that we have to make in that church because these people are worshiping against the law of the land. You don't have to say effective disciple makers believe the Lord's commands. But in America, I believe it is absolutely essential that we say it because for some reason, we've moved away from believing the Lord's commands are true forever. That God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God's commands never contradict his nature. Never contradict his nature. In fact, his commands for us display his perfect holy nature. And when we read God's commands and we obey God's commands, we are becoming more like Christ in holiness and in God-glorifying lives. But for some reason, we live in a culture, we live in a church culture in America where God's definitive specific commands are thrown out. But I know not here. The preservation of sound doctrine is undermined if we ever start to doubt what the Bible teaches as morally right and wrong. Defining biblical morality is, uh, excuse me, redefining biblical morality is the quickest route to becoming an apostate church. An apostate church is a church that has fallen away. It is a church where the lampstand of God's presence and glory is removed and people are left to just a religious exercise, which doesn't help anybody. If anything, it does more harm than good. I don't say if anything, it does more harm than good. An apostate church, Ichabod, the spirit has departed that place. Effective Disciple makers believe the Lord's commands, are in submission to the Lord's commands, want with all their heart and life to obey the Lord's, uh, where the Word of God displays His commands and also where God is leading us to do specific things in specific times and specific places. But then it comes to the place where an effective disciple maker teaches the Lord's commands, teaches others the commands of Scripture. Aren't you glad that someone came alongside of you, discipled you, and taught you this is what God says you should do? Amen? So the commands about our mission, our very mission, the last words of Jesus of making disciples includes this idea, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I command you. 
And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Now understand this, true discipleship cannot happen apart from the working of the Holy Spirit. Discipleship and establishing someone as a person who's going to go out and be light and go out and be a disciple maker in their life is not about us just teaching a person to, be, to live a moral life. Amen? It has to encompass the Holy Spirit. It can't just be a do-gooder who's just trying to do better. But it's the work of the Holy Spirit in a life of submission to God and his will and his commands. Commands about our mission. Commands about love. John 13, 34 through 35 says, a new command I give you. That you love one another. Even as I have loved you. Agape one another, even as I have agape you. Love one another unconditionally, volitionally. Forgive each other. Love each other as I have loved you. And you also love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Is it a command for you and I to love these people? Is there any question? Is that hard? Y'all look around, just ask, is it hard to love these people? Somebody say, there's a few of them maybe. <laughs> love. Unconditional love for each other. Let's boil it all down. It's a command, isn't it? But it is extravagant what it looks like and what it feels like and the experience of having friendship and fellowship with people that agape me. Feels good, doesn't it? To find somebody who just wants the best for my life. And is not looking for anything in return. That's what church is supposed to be like. That is how people will know that we are his disciples. But it's not a suggestion. It is a command. Love each other. And we teach this. When we're discipling people, we teach them. We come alongside of them and we help them learn how to be humble. We teach them how to love each other, how to forgive each other, how to not be a pain. A painful person to love, to be, listen, a loving person is an easy person to love. A person that doesn't yet know how to love or is not being obedient to the command of loving is a tough person. This person is weak. This person is a hard person to deal with in the church because they love themselves. They are self-centered rather than selfless. Then there are commands about daily living. How many of you know that the Bible and, and the New Testament, we're not, talking about, we're not talking about the law necessarily or the Ten Commandments. Guys, we realize that there are Ten Commandments, but we realize that in the New Testament, there are a lot of commands that tell us as Christians how we should live. Somebody say amen. And a lot of them deal with our everyday life. Let's just throw out a few. Ephesians 5.18, what does it say? Do not get drunk with wine. For this is dissipation, 
leads to debauchery. Do not get drunk with wine, which leads to terrible life. A life out of control. A life out of its mind. But be filled with the Spirit. Is this a command? (laughs) Oh boy. Is this a command? A New Testament command? Do not get drunk with wine, which leads to debauchery. So we're in discipleship with our brothers and sisters in Christ. And we're with a young brother. We're with a young brother that's been drinking and getting drunk maybe since he was able to start drinking wine or beer or whatever he's drinking. He's been getting drunk for a long time. So guess what? I get in discipleship and I sit down with my brothers in Christ. This young man loves the Lord. He loves Christ. He wants to follow the Lord. And we lay this command and say, listen, hey, buddy, Jim. Sorry if your name is Jim. Jim, you got to stop getting drunk. Well, why? Because the Bible says that you need to stop getting drunk. Because it leads to debauchery. Well, Jim has one of two things to do, one one of two directions, one of two decisions at that moment. Either he's going to stop getting drunk or he's going to keep getting drunk. Are we all following the logic here? The problem with the Jim that wants to keep getting drunk That disobedience to that command is dreadful. It's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking. Guys, I'm your pastor and I love you. I love you guys. I want y'all to have so much fun tomorrow night watching the ball game. Don't go to Edward's house. He has a little bitty TV. I just want y'all to know right right now. (laughs) It's the worst football experience New Year's Eve that I've ever had in my entire life. Like a 32-inch TV on his mantle. I had to stand two feet away to actually see what was going on. I haven't, can't see anything anyway. But anyway, what just happened? I can't see. But anyway, I want y'all to have fun at the game. I want you to eat, you know, nachos and have a party. And do th- You know, it's going to be way too late. I don't know why they do this on school nights and work nights but anyway don't get drunk don't get drunk stop getting drunk with wine it leads to debauchery it leads to licentiousness it leads to immorality it leads to doing things guys my heart breaks when I think about the young men who have been in discipleship at our church that were there, they were present, they were gathering, and they were listening, and they were trying, and they wanted to follow Christ, and they wanted to go in line with that. And and in my heart, what I believed about these young men uh, at the time, and maybe God's still going to work in their life, and I pray that he does somehow reel these guys back in, but what I saw was their refusal Their refusal of continuing to get drunk with wine led their lives into total destruction. And it's heartbreaking. And and I believe when we are in discipleship with, with brothers and sisters in Christ that we love, that we're in relationship with and fellowship with, We're encouraging and we're bringing accountability. And a guy says, listen, man, guys, y'all help me. These these are the things that we discuss. Guys, y'all help me with this area of my life. I know that God has commanded me to do this. And y'all want y'all to pray for me because it is my heart and my desire to obey God in this area. And I'm losing. And we come alongside of them and say, man, brother, let's go. Let's go. Let's pray for each other. You know, for some of you here today, you are so scared about getting in discipleship because there's some area of your life that you're unwilling to give up. You know, you know the Lord's commands. You know that God has said, stop doing this. 
And you know that if you get in a small group, that guess what they're going to deal with? This and everything else. And I just want to encourage you. I want to challenge you, brother. Some of that stuff, listen, some of that stuff, the only way you're going to get through it is with help and with encouragement and with spirit-filled, spirit-led men that are going to pray for you and love you and walk with you through these battles. Guys, understand and know, know that the Bible doesn't say anything about drinking alcohol. It says getting drunk with wine. Don't look down on your brother or your sister that drinks wine. And don't look down on them for getting drunk with wine. We shouldn't look down on anybody. Amen? But our heart is to bring in relationship, in fellowship, to bring God's commands into each other's lives with accountability and say, listen, this is a stumbling block in your life. And it's, it's, it's going to lead to debauchery. Stop. Let's go. Y'all got the point. First Thessalonians 4, 3 through 8 says, For this is the will of God, your sanctification. That is, that you abstain from sexual immorality. Is that a suggestion? Let me just ask y'all, church. Is that a suggestion? To abstain from sexual immorality or a command? Suggestion? Command? Command, yes. <laughs> the will of God, your sanctification, that is that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in lustful passion like the Gentiles who do not know God, and that no man transgress or defraud his brother in the matter because of the Lord is the avenger in all these things, just as we also told you before and solemnly warned you, for God has not called you, called us for the purpose of impurity, but in sanctification. So he who rejects this is not rejecting man, but the God who gives his Holy Spirit to you. The churches that reject God's command to abstain from sexual immorality are not rejecting man. They are rejecting God. Clear. Thirdly this morning, foundational belief in an instruction of our blessed hope of salvation through Christ is an essential element of true discipleship. Verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, according to the commandment of God our Savior, and of Christ Jesus, who is our hope. Guys, talking about salvation, talking about the gospel, immersing our life in the gospel, preaching and teaching the sound doctrines of salvation are essential to discipleship in our church. Titus 2.11 For the grace of God has appeared bringing salvation to all men instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. The hope of our salvation. Guys, in your discipleship, in your training and building up of brothers and sisters in Christ, establishing them in their faith, talk about the hope of salvation. Talk about Jesus. Talk about the cross. Talk about justification by faith alone in Christ alone. Talk about the the doctrines of salvation. We'll get into that more. Hope defined. Hope is an opinion or belief not amounting to certainty but grounded on substantial evidence. The Christian indulges a hope that his sins are pardoned. It is confidence in a future event, the highest degree of well-founded expectation of good. As a hope founded on God's gracious promises, it is a, in a scriptural sense. 
1 Peter 1, 3 through 5 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who is protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. These, this is the meat. This is our diet in discipleship, is our salvation in Christ. Colossians 1 tells us where our hope is found. Of this church, I was made a minister according to the stewardship from God bestowed on me for your benefit so that I might fully carry out the preaching of the word of God. That is the mystery which has been hidden from the past ages and generations but has now been manifest to his saints to whom God willed to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles which is Christ in you, the hope of glory in discipleship there must be in conviction in belief in the spirit of God there must be in true conversion a hope on the inside. A hope that trans, uh, transposes or transcends our circumstances, the hurts and the pains and the disappointments and the discouragements of life. That, guys, that when we get together, and let me, this is inside stuff. We're all coming here this morning with all kinds of cares and hurts and pains and one of our sisters in Christ Miss Barbara Brown the doctors have said she's very close to going on to be with the Lord shaking Mike's hand this morning in brotherhood and you could see that the hope of Christ transcends for him this moment of grief. The grief is there. The pain is there. This is his best friend. This is the woman that has made him the man that he is. And every one of us men that are anything can say that. Amen? His best friend. What do you do? In this world, in this life, without that hope. When we are discipling, when we are making disciples, we are centering our lives on the hope of Christ. This is what, this is the conviction that causes us to be able to swim upstream. Christ in you. And if Christ is not in you, you do not have this hope. And if you are in Christ, you know that he is our only hope. It's the eye of the tiger, amen? <laughs> He's on the eye of the tiger again. I got so many texts and comments about that last week. Believers that are focused on the mission of Christ. I'm so thankful for you guys. Wow. We're going to be in verse 2 again next week. <laughs> I'm so thankful. This message today in centering us on uh, discipleship doesn't mean, wouldn't mean anything 
without being in a church where there are disciples and disciple makers. Amen? This would be like me just speaking over the top of, of a congregation about something that none of us are really that interested in. But when you are being called upon Wednesday night, some of you, Wednesday night, you're going to be called into a group of disciples where you're going to sit at a table with a group of men, a group of young ladies, and you are, you are in that place where you are making disciples of someone, then we constantly need this challenge and encouragement and understanding of what we are doing and what we are making. And here's the Here's the test. Where is, where's the next pastor of Crossroads Baptist Church right now? I promise y'all that my time is limited. Hopefully to another 30 years, but it's limited. I can't do this forever. I don't want to do this forever, but I can't. Somebody is probably already in the world today, is already maybe a believer today that is going to stand, hopefully, for 30 years and preach here at Crossroads Baptist Church and what are they what are they going to care what are they going to propagate what are they going to extend what's going to happen it's inevitable with most every institution where and I'm not I'm not referring, this is not an illustration about Brandon, okay? This is an illustration just about the way things go. Institutions or churches or places where great men, great pastors have preached with the eye of the tiger <laughs> with fire in their bellies and have been courageous and have been faithful and have been Principled, but also they have preached sound doctrine. Many places and many times within, with, with Christian organizations and institutions, that patriarch retires or passes away or moves on and things immediately begin to change. The next generation has been standing by thinking, oh man, there's so many, so much of this that we could do better, we could do differently, we could, we could make this thing something great. I watched our college, I'm not going to tell you what college I went to, but I was right in the middle of our Christian Bible college becoming more of a liberal arts institution and began to see kind of that transition of that school as so many do. I think, te I think Texas Christian University, y'all just go look up the, what it is today and you might find, and I'm, I'm not dogging on them because of what's going to happen on tomorrow night. Dogging on. Anyway. <laughs> but it's, I just say it's not what it used to be. But maybe when it started, it was something Seems like maybe it was. Christian. That word does not mean very much these days, it doesn't seem. But we all have to think. My brother Richard, um, my brothers here in church, we think about, I don't know if you guys think about, what are my sons 
going to tell the world when I'm gone? What is going to be their philosophy? What is their doctrine? What is their truth and what is that founded on and grounded in? What are they going to preach to the world? Out of the same home come a son or daughter going out into the world who are light and are sound in their doctrine and their truth of their faith. And out of that same home, another son goes out and and propagates the exact opposite, total contradictory philosophy and ideology of mom and dad. The grace of God is the only common denominator in those things. But I don't know about you guys. But the person that fills this pulpit next, I don't know about y'all, but I just want them to do one, one thing. Is preach the word of God. To preach the word of God. And you said that could mean a million different things. And I'm sorry to say this. I want that to mean what is in my heart of what I believe that it means to preach the word of God. And that is don't improve upon it. Don't add to it. Don't don't water it down. Say what the Bible says. Explain what the Bible says. And believe in that establishment of sound doctrine. Otherwise, we're going to have strange doctrine that leads to spiritual shipwreck. And it is, it happens so fast. It can happen so fast. May God's grace be with us. Amen, church.